Rub your eyes often? Blurry or double vision driving at night? Red light, stop. You may have keratoconus, a progressive eye disease which can cause vision loss. Visit couldbkc.com to take the quiz. If you rub your eyes and are experiencing changes to your vision, this may be a symptom of keratoconus, a progressive eye disease that may lead to significant vision loss. Early diagnosis is important, so don't ignore the simple act of rubbing your eyes. Please visit livingwithkc.com. The All Eyes Visual VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicel technology. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day. The first and only FDA approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome back to part two of my interview with doctors Nita Shami and Gloria Chu. In this episode, the doctors dive deep into the newest treatments for keratoconus and corneal disease. They also share some surprising information. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell. Also, please leave comments. Be sure to watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube Movies and Shows. And tune in to our brand new radio show, Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. Central Time on AM 1280, The Patriot. When we talk about corneal cross-linking, we want to prevent a disaster from keratoconus. Let's talk about uh, RIP and Decimase membrane, dreaded high drops. Tell us what that is, and if that happens to a patient, what are they looking at? Uh, Dr. Chu. So corneal high drops is uh, an unfortunate consequence of just kind of this pressure and bulging in the cornea, typically in moderate to advanced keratoconus patients. So you have a tear in the decimase membrane, which allows fluid from the front part of the eye, the aqueous fluid, to enter the corneal tissue. This causes thickening and swelling, and often it looks like a white eye, and typically when the patient wakes up. So they'll wake up and say, I cannot see, I have severe blur, and my eye, the front of my eye looks white. And this is because of the swelling and edema present in the corneal tissue. And it's because of just, as we've discussed already, there's weakening of the corneal tissue, as you have this ectasia and bulging and distortion, sometimes that back layer of the cornea can split. And so it's really debilitating for patients. It can take weeks or months to fully resolve. There are some medications that you can prescribe to expedite the healing of the hot corneal high drops. You can prescribe some topical drops such as uh, Miro 128. It's a hypertonic saline solution that helps to draw out fluid from the swollen cornea. You can sometimes also use a, you know, a topical antibiotic and steroid just to calm the eye. Um, but really, the, the eye is really out of commission for a couple weeks or months even, depending on the degree 
of the swelling. And so another reason why, if we can prevent further thinning and bulging, getting to the moderate to advanced stages, you know, we can help to prevent the uh, development of corneal hydrops. Dr. Shami? Yeah, there's also sur uh, surgical um, solution potentially. Again, because hydrops occurs due to a break in the decimase and, and the fluid gushing into the cornea and causing swelling and edema and blistering and such, um, we can also put an air bubble in the eye or a gas bubble that is more prolonged and that can impede the fluid from coming through the decimase and allow for the decimase to heal or fibrose. Um, and that has been effective um, in, in speeding up the recovery from high drops. Um, and it's a really kind of nice and uh, creative way of addressing it. And typically, do these people scar after? Yeah. And, you know, I have seen some cases that the scarring has led to improvement of the keratoconus because what happens is they scar in the area where the, the steepest part of the cornea was. And the scarring causes fibrosis and 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 shrinking back of the the cone. Now, I wouldn't recommend letting <laughs> the keratoconus progress to that point, but there have been cases where the keratoconus is somewhat improved after the high drops. At least the the, the cone is not as prominent after, but oh. it's usually a devastating um, uh, kind of complication because it's also a, a sign that your cornea is now so extremely thin that it's extremely fragile and it may be too thin to have collagen cross-linking. And often patients who have high drops, there's the steep cornea is so much that even a scleral lens may be difficult to fit. Uh, although Gloria Chu can fit anyone with a scleral lens. Um, but they tend to be at a point where, you know, the next step may be a corneal transplant. I would so, agree. Yeah. I, I think by that point, if there's significant scarring that happened after the high drops that doesn't clear up, although it's flatter, sometimes even though I can fit the eye and I can vault over any irregular cornea, if the scarring is in the visual axis and so debilitating, this is a reason that I would refer for a corneal transplant. Yeah. So we don't want to get to that point. So we want to talk about collagen, corneal collagen cross-linking. Dr. Shami, take us through the procedure, epi on, epi off, which is better? People want to know. Well, the FDA approved approach as of now is the epi off approach to collagen cross-linking. Um, and uh, in, in, you know, using um, the FDA approach, FDA approved a light device uh, from Glucos and um, the riboflavin that's all packaged together. Uh, so Anything else is not FDA approved. Anything else is not um, insurance covered. So if, if you're not having epi off using the, uh, the, the system that is approved by the FDA, you, it cannot be submitted to insurance legally. So that's kind of the package. So which is better? As of now, the, all the clinical trials have shown that epi off is highly effective there is now studies being done looking at epi on versus epi off, and there's some uh, approaches to epi on, and I'll explain what the difference is, uh, that have been effective, effective. The reason epithelium or the surface of the cornea needs to be taken off is, is because the, mo the molecule of the riboflavin that has to bond with the, co with the collagen fibers um, is too big to go between the, the epithelial cells. So the epithelial cells or epithelial layer of the cornea impedes the riboflavin from penetrating into the corneal tissue, which is a, an important step of the procedure um, in order for the collagen to respond then to the UV light that's delivered. And so the epithelium being removed allows for the riboflavin to infuse into the corneal stroma. It allows for the collagen cross-linking to occur in a highly effective fashion. Uh, so I'll walk you through the steps. The patient comes in, it's, we do it in our office, most people do. Um, we take him to our actually LASIK suite and uh, lay the patient comfortably on our LASIK bed and uh, using numbing drops and sterilize around the eyes. We numb the eyes, um, we sterilize and we put a sterile drape around the eyes and I come in 
and I gently remove the cell layer, the epithelial cell layer of the central about eight millimeter central disc of the cornea. This is not at all painful to the patient. It just feels funny to them. They often kind of tickle and, and, and they laugh about it. Uh, so it's not a painful step or none of the procedure is painful at all. And then for the first half hour, so we kind of, we do it the traditional way that's been FDA approved and published on. For the first half hour, every two minutes, we instill a drop of the riboflavin onto the corneal surface. And this is done for two minutes. I'm sorry, for 30 minutes, every two minutes, a drop is instilled. And I tell my patients to bring their music and an AirPod or listen to a podcast like yours while they're having the procedure done. And, um, and then after the 30 minutes, we check to make sure the riboflavin has gone through the corneal tissue by looking for what's called flare, uh, which is kind of this appearance in the anterior chamber behind the cornea. That's a telltale sign that there's been enough time for the riboflavin to penetrate through and really soak the corneal tissue with the riboflavin, which is the vitamin that will, I tell my patients, it's the vitamin that will fortify your cornea. And then after the half hour of that, we then put a lid speculum to keep the eyelid open. And then I start the light treatment. So I bring the light um, uh, delivery um, uh, uh, and, and focus it onto the corneal surface. And it's basically a very, very, not a bright light. It's a kind of a fluorescent colored light uh, that's um, uh, focused onto the corneal surface. And for every two minutes, the riboflavin is continued to be dropped on the corneal surface. And after half an hour of the UV light, um, a contact lens, a bandaged contact lens is placed over the eye. The patient is given eye drops, antibiotic, and steroids. Uh, they're also, I also give my patients a sleeping medication as well as pain medications in case they have discomfort that night. And typically, because these patients are young and they're, they're otherwise very healthy, Typically within two days, their corneal surface is fully healed, two to three days maximum. And the discomfort is really mostly that night after the procedure. But because I give my patients pain medications and sleeping medications, they kind of sleep it off. And this is no more painful than, actually it's less painful uh, in my experience than PRK patients. And that is because we're not ablating the tissue. The tissue, the, de the, um, the scaffold onto which the epithelium is going to heal back on, it's still intact. And so the epithelium heals really fast in these patients. Um, so in my mind, epithelium off um, is not uh, dangerous. Um, there's, you know, people talk about the danger of epithelium off because of infection. I have, knock on wood, have not had a single case that has gotten infected um, uh, with epithelium off, uh, collagen cross sinking. And I also feel strongly that in order for, for us to truly prevent progression of this condition, I got to do it right the first time. You can't dilly-dally around it. And so the fear that is, 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 um, uh, is kind of pushed on patients about epithelium off is, is exaggerated in my mind. And I think under watch, epithelium off can be an incredible, it is an incredibly safe approach but more importantly is the most effective and the most trusted and the FDA approved approach to collagen cross thinking. And there really for now is no better way. Um, and so that's kind of my-, my um, Are you my, doing both eyes at the same time? No, so I do one eye at a time. I space them about a month apart. Obviously you need to, uh, uh, Gloria mentioned this, a lot of patients have very asymmetric keratoconus. So not every patient needs bilateral collagen cross sinking. You need to show and demonstrate progression in both in, in each eye separately to justify it. Um, but I separate them by about a month or two. The vision, even after the epithelium has healed, the vision tends to, to fluctuate for the first month and a half or so. And what I tell patients is that your vision will get worse before it gets better. Actually, even the corneal topography becomes steeper before it flattens. And it's really incredible. And, I, and, and, and the way I describe it to my patients and our, and our um, optometric network of colleagues is that the, it's, imagine the collagen fibers are like, you know, relaxing and then they're rebonding and they have to kind of really create these stronger bonds. And that process causes relaxation and then tightening. And I've seen three, four, five diopters of flattening of, of a corneal, uh, of a keratoconic cornea 
I saw a patient who was 2050 uncorrected vision with three diopters of astigmatism. At two years mark, they came back 2020 uncorrected. So there's been, you know, I would say half my patients, there's significant reversal of their keratoconus if it's caught early enough in, in their disease. But it sometimes takes, it takes at least two months for you to start detecting some flattening. And I have seen continual flattening over one to two years after collagen cross-linking. And the thickness of the cornea, is that important? It, it thins, yes. And it's important even in going into collagen cross-linking. So right. you need to have, exactly, you need to have ideally 400 microns because uh, you, you know, the thought being is that if your cornea is thinner than 400 microns, the collagen crossing or the UV exposure could potentially be damaging to the corneal endothelium and the lens. Now I've done collagen crossing in, in corneas that are slightly less than 400 microns thick by thickening it, but you know, there's ways of getting around it. In those cases, I do consider doing epi on because the epithelium itself has about 50 microns thickness. So it, it's somewhat protective in those. So in those cases, it's like, you know, it's a last stitch effort. Um, and if I, if I have, you know, if I can, I, I, I do it, even if it's not going to be as effective, I do epi on in those cases. But yes, you want the cornea to be 400 microns thick going into collagen cross thinking. And then afterwards, you do see thinning of the cornea. You definitely see thinning of the cornea. It's not that it thins, it actually gets compacted. So even on OCT, if you do that high definition OCT of a cornea that has had collagen cross thinking, it's incredible. You see almost like like a Grand Canyon look to it where the front, you know, uh, the, the anterior two thirds of the cornea looks more compacted because the fibers are tightened and strengthened. And do you ever use vitamin C it recommend in the post-op period? Um, you know, I, I had, I have in the past, but not in my collagen cross thinking patients. I haven't, I have in, in other types of case, cases like corneal melts and things like that, but no, I haven't. To decrease to haze. Doc, Dr. Chu, can you go over the post-op uh, you know, post uh, protocol? Absolutely. So I agree with everything that Dr. Shami has said. And I did want to comment on kind of the healing process. So after the cross-linking, when the epithelium has healed, because we in our Department of Ophthalmology also only provide the FDA-approved version, which is covered by insurance, and also that has been studied vigorously. So we're only offering the epi-off version um, in our clinic. But, you know, Dr. Shami mentioned that you'll see vision changes definitely in the first month and a half. And I would say that's the period that you see the greatest amount of change, but it can spill over, I would say, into three, four, maybe even five to six months when you're looking at best corrected vision in your glasses or soft toric lenses. As the cornea is remodeling and, and getting stronger, or you see this demarcation line, which you know tends to fade, you see you know, transient haze as part of the remodeling process, you're also gonna expect some visual changes as well. It gets steeper within the first month, then, then it gets flatter. Of course, you're gonna expect your glasses to shift. So I typically don't um, recommend the patient pay for new glasses until we can uh, document a stable manifest refraction over two visits. And typically that's around six months. Although, as you said, you can, as if you're still getting flattening, that means that the curvature and the prescriptions also still changing, which could be gradually for several years. Now, in terms of getting your patient functional and back to work and back in their life and seeing their best, it may not necessarily be in glasses yet. So they can use an old pair or you know, if they're desperate, they can change the lenses every couple of months. But with specialty contacts, whether it's soft specialty lenses that are thicker to help mask the front surface irregularity, RGPs and scleral lenses, as long as the epithelium has healed, I am comfortable putting a patient back into their contact lenses. So if it's a scleral lens, they're already trained and you're not teaching them a new technique that could cause trauma to their corneal tissue. Their trained scleral lens wear, 
they can oftentimes use their same scleral lens within two weeks after the bandage lens has been removed and the epithelium has healed. With RGPs, because it sits on the corneal tissue and rubs and moves on the cornea, you wanna make sure definitely that the cornea has completely healed. Um, and at that point, I would say even after four weeks, you can get back into an RGP lens. And then soft lenses, you know, although you can wear them safely sooner, the prescription may be changing a bit in the soft lenses, the uh, conventional toric lenses, because the astigmatism is changing. And to the point that, you know, Dr. Shami made about a patient coming in with uncorrected 2050 vision, and then a couple years later, having greatly improved uncorrected vision, I have seen that before as well. And I think it's remarkable, but I think it's important to, you know, um, educate our patients that they shouldn't necessarily expect an improved vision after the cross-linking. The intention isn't necessarily to give them better vision like LASIK or refractive surgery, but it can be an added bonus in some patients where we see significant flattening of the cornea. Um, so I, you know, I've definitely seen that happen myself. I've seen improved best corrected vision in glasses and patients are happy about that. I've also on the flip side, seen some cases where it didn't improve at all or even got worse. As we know with every surgical procedure, you know, there can be complications including corneal haze and uh, healing um, challenges. But it's, it's great to know that in some of the patients, they're actually seeing better after the fact. And, um, but again, don't want to make them think that they're going to get yeah. better vision after the procedure. And Dr. Do, do you ever recommend vitamin C to decrease haze? I don't actually. So, I mean, steroids, I feel that are, are truly effective and it gets really right. to the crux of the problem. And, and steroids early on is important. And haze is the case that I, I haven't, well, I see haze often, but they're not symptomatic haze. So it's a very different haze than one sees in like a scar, scarring from other procedures and such. Um, it's kind of this almost like a, what I tell um, my All colleagues right. is that it's a haze from the collagen fibers and, 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 and tightening and it right. resolves after about three months, it goes away and rarely is it symptomatic. I also have found that patients, even if their vision, let's go, let's say their best manifest refraction pre-op was 2050 and now they're like 2060 um, as they're recovering from their collagen cross-linking, you may look at the number and you say it got worse, but you ask the patient and they say, oh my God, my vision's so much better. And that is not uncommon. Be and I think it has, it goes back to what Dr. Chu said earlier about the higher order aberrations and the aberrometry and such. And if you were to assess that, so as the vision, as the cornea is remodeling itself um, uh, and the irregularity of it is, is improving, the patient's vision on the chart may not be as good as you know, it was before, or it may be the same. More, more often than not, it's just the same but the patient's symptoms improve and their experience of their vision improves. There's been some studies that show that oral riboflavin before maybe the patient is ready for cross-linking, oral riboflavin, sending them out in the sun every day. Is that something that you've read about or thought about either one of you? I, I've definitely read about that. I think it was very few subjects that were reported on in this protocol, I it's very interesting and fascinating because I take riboflavin um, pills for my headaches and migraines and I'm out in the sun. So am I being cross-linked? I, I don't know. I don't know exactly the degree. I think more studies need to be done, but for sure it cannot be as effective as directly working on the cornea tissue. So it's not something that I've recommended, even though I'm doing it myself for a different purpose. Um, I don't know, what do you think, Netta? Yeah, I think I agree with you. I think there's some studies out there, um, the, the, the numbers are low and it's not com as compelling as we like it to be. 
There's no question that collagen cross-linking in the form of, you know, the KXL system, the FDA approved glucose version of collagen cross-linking has been proven effective at a high degree. I wouldn't do it in place of this. I would also be aware of opportunities for, um, a, you know, for marketing uh, things that may not be effective and, you know, taking advantage of, you um, the vulnerability of our of patients. I mean, there are people out there who, you know, there there isn't much control around nutraceuticals, for example, and and that there may be advertisements that are um, empty and and empty of data. And so, beware. You know, seek guidance from your doctor. Um, just because out it's out there on Google search uh, doesn't mean that it's effective. But what you are describing has been actually presented at meetings and such, and. But again, it's at its early stage. It hasn't been found to be as effective as, you know, as collagen crossing in the form that Gloria and I talked about. So be on the lookout maybe for your children uh, who hopefully will never develop collagen crossing, but I mean, uh, keratoconus, that may be an option for them. But for the current generation of keratoconic patients, the only effective treatment option for stabilizing the disease is the KXL system that is collagen cross-linking EPL. You know, I've thought about, I wonder if keratoconus could be a riboflavin deficiency because people that have a riboflavin deficiency have these skin problems. They have cracking of the skin around their lips and keratoconus goes along with skin problems. I know it's something that people haven't studied, but it was something that I kind of thought of. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if you, have you ever thought of something like that or? Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I've made that connection exactly as a riboflavin deficiency, um, because I think there's keratoconus is just so multifactorial. It comes from genetics. It comes from the environment. Eye rubbing, uh, you know, as you mentioned, maybe a component of allergic conjunctivitis or eczema is contributing to the rubbing and itching, which may be increasing inflammatory mediators. I, I don't know that I've thought about it as a riboflavin deficiency, although it's used in cross-linking. Um, I'll have to look into that. I don't know, I thought I'd bring it up, but let's go to corneal transplants. Uh, Dr. Shami, the, the alphabet soup of corneal transplants gets very confusing. You know, whether it's DALK -D or PKP or, uh -huh. or DSEC, I mean, all these different these different alphabet soup of terms. Can you bring us through what the different ones mean and which ones are being used now, which one aren't, aren't used? So if we start with PKP. Well, PKP is penetrating keratoplasty, which means the entire thickness of the cornea is replaced by a new cornea from a donor uh, of some uh, from the eye bank. Um, so penetrating keratoplasty is typically reserved for conditions that affect all the layers of the cornea, which are rare conditions. Uh, really, the main uh, indication in my practice for penetrating ker keratoplasty would be uh, a penetrating wound. So someone who has had a, you know, um, a, a knife wound or glass cut into the, the cornea. Then, um, then the other, like you said, um, what did you call it? The soup? Alphab alphabet soup. Alphabet soup. Alphabet soup of corneal transplant comes down to what layer of the cornea is being replaced. So let's talk about the back layer. So the condition, the conditions that affect the very back layer, the endothelial layer of the cornea, such as Fuchs dystrophy or pseudophagic bullous keratopathy are the most common conditions that cause the endothelial cells not to pump well and the cornea as a result becomes swollen. Um, the uh, treatment for that is, the ideal treatment for that is to replace just the disease layer. And EK. now in my practice, I approach it by doing DMEC, which is decimase membrane endothelial keratoplasty, which is a perfect anatomical replacement. The prior generation to DMEC was DSAC, which is decimase stripping endothelial keratoplasty, which is a thicker tissue that's uh, transplanted into the eye after the, the disease layer is removed. Um, and so DMEC and DSAC are kind of sisters, um, but one is more robust than the other as far as thickness is concerned, but also is not, doesn't lead to as good a vision as DMEC does. Um, and then you have DALK, which is the anterior layer. 
And DALK is deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. And that's essentially replacing the corneal stroma and the surface epithelium, leaving the endothelium intact for conditions that affect the corneal stroma, but not the endothelium. And the most common indication for deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty would be keratoconus uh, or ectatic uh, conditions or other corneal dystrophies such as granular dystrophy and others that only cause opacification of the stroma, but the endothelium is intact. And the reason deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty is superior in my mind to penetrating keratoplasty for conditions like keratoconus is because if you leave the endothelium intact, the risk of rejection is significantly, significantly improved because the most common uh, layer of a corneal transplant that often gets rejected is the endothelial layer. So if a patient has keratoconus and they got, get bad enough that they need a corneal transplant, they absolutely should ask if their surgeon offers deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty because you know there's now been many studies, numerous studies to show that a patient who has deep anterior lame lamellar keratoplasty is able to hold on to that corneal transplant usually for the rest of their life with a risk of rejection being less than 0.1%, 0.1%, one in a thousand. But if they have a penetrating keratoplasty instead of a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, their risk of rejection is much higher. It could be anywhere from one to upwards of 10%. And they tend to need multiple corneal transplants in their lifetime because their endothelial layer, given that it's not their own and it's a donor's, dies out sooner. So a 20-some-year-old, in my mind, who needs a corneal transplant for keratoconus should most definitely have a deep anterior lamella keratoplasty and not a penetrating keratoplasty. And then one other alphabet soup is FLEC or femtosecond laser-enabled keratoplasty. And that is when I, I use a laser to create the, the, create the cut into the cornea, where normally when you do it manually with a blade, it's a vertical cut and the transplant and the, the host have a vertical um, in, um, um, uh, a cut or um, graft host junction versus uh, using a laser, you can create a zigzag cut. And so it's much tighter wound, much stronger wound. And the contour of that cornea is much better. And my approach to keratoconic patients is I use laser to create a zigzag and I do a deep anterior lamella keratoplasty, too. So it's really the best of all worlds. And my goal is, first of all, my first goal is never to need to do a corneal transplant on a keratoconic, hopefully catch them early enough. But if they do need it to do this approach, my hope is that they will be able to hold on to this cornea, that the cornea will have a normal contour and that they'll never have to have worry about rejection or having to replace their corneal transplant. And what's the post-op like? Post-op of a, of a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty? Yeah, so post-op, there's stitches holding the graft in place. And because, again, the, the host endothelium is intact, I tend to be able to speed up the post-operative course for these patients as compared to a penetrating keratoplasty that requires a lot more prolonged um, process. But a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty uh, usually steroid eye drops for a whole year. So they use, I taper down every three months. I tend to be more conservative. I do four times a day for three months, then three times a day, then twice a day. Um, and then once a day, they have antibiotics on board until the surface epithelium heals, which takes about a week. Um, it's an uncomfortable, definitely for the first week, but after the epithelium heals and the swelling goes down, the patients don't really feel much. They don't feel the stitches. They're covered by the epithelium. The vision fluctuates for the first six months. Um, I do a running suture. It's a singular suture that goes all the way around. So I, I, uh, in the first three months, I do adjustments to improve the vision and the contour of the cornea. And they tend to have better vision by the three month mark than they did prior to surgery. They can be fitted with a contact lens at the three months um, under very close monitoring mm -hmm. by the optometrist. And, you know, they need to be monitored. I see them one day, one week, one month, and then every three months. 
because there's risk of pressure spikes on glaucoma, on the steroid eye drops. There's risk of infection that they need to be monitored. It's not straightforward. Corneal transplant has high morbidity associated with it, which is again why collagen cross-thinking is such an important addition to managing these patients. And then at the one year mark, I remove the suture, I remove the stitch, and I try to, uh, my goal is to keep the astigmatism less than three diopters. And with my approach, with the, with the, with the zigzag incision, the running suture, um, I, in my practice, 60% of my patients have less than 3.5 diopters of astigmatism, which I think is a great success, believe it or not. Um, but even with all these efforts, there are cases that have just recently, I'd removed the suture on a patient who had two diopters with the suture in, and now he has 10 diopters of astigmatism that I have to now fine tune by doing astigmatic keratotomy and adjusting his vision. So high level of morbidity. Um, I don't, I love the surgery. Uh, it, it's one of my favorite surgeries to do, but if I don't ever do it again, I think it's a great gift to patients never have to have corneal transplants. Rub your eyes often? Blurry or double vision driving at night? Red light, stop. You may have keratoconus, a progressive eye disease which can cause vision loss. Visit couldidbkc.com to take the quiz. If you rub your eyes and are experiencing changes to your vision, this may be a symptom of keratoconus, a progressive eye disease that may lead to significant vision loss. Early diagnosis is important, so don't ignore the simple act of rubbing your eyes. Please visit livingwithkc.com. MacuHealth, your science-born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. I really appreciate you explaining that because it gets very complicated. Yes. Uh, I, why I have you here, let's talk about, are you for refractive surgery? Are you doing mostly LASIK? Are you doing SMILE? What, what are you doing and what's the pros and cons of each one? Good question. So I'm, I'm doing mostly LASIK uh, and PRK and ICL, implantable contact lens. We don't yet have SMILE in our practice, but we are most definitely uh, uh, adding it on board uh, in the next uh, year or so because there's been some improvements in SMILE that has encouraged us to consider adding it to our armamentarium. Um, so pros and cons, I mean, I, uh, pros and cons of LASIK versus SMILE. Yeah, versus SMILE versus PRK. Well, LASIK, um, let's explain what they are. LASIK is basically a uh, refractive procedure uh, where we ablate the cornea under a flap. So a flap is created. The flap is about 100 microns. And so when you think about a normal cornea is about 550 microns, that flap itself already is about 20% of the thickness of the cornea. So the flap uh, uh, thins the cornea by about 18 to 20%. And then we ablate the cornea under the flap and we put the flap back on and allow it to heal. If a, corneal, if a cornea is a perfectly normal cornea, which most are the ones that we recommend LASIK to, um, it, it's a non-issue. But if a cornea already has weakness, then I don't recommend LASIK uh, because I want to hold on to every bit of strength that that cornea has. And that LASIK flap takes away about 18% of that strength. Uh, so LASIK is a wonderful option if you are, as a surgeon, are uh, obsessive compulsive like I am in detecting any signs of concern around a uh, potential risk of ectasia. Now, what PRK is, is ablating the cornea on the surface. So you reshape the cornea on the surface without creating a flap. And so whenever there's a patient where you are comfortable saying that they don't have keratoconus, you're comfortable saying they don't have form frust, uh, or they may be borderline and their correction is such that you're comfortable recommending corneal refractive procedure, um, but you are maybe have an inkling of a concern about ectasia, you could consider PRK over LASIK to further minimize the risk of them developing ectasia. 
another situation where you would recommend PRK over LASIK if, is if the patient, so sorry, <coughs> if a patient doesn't have enough corneal thickness. And so, um, uh, you know, for every diopter that we need to correct of myopia, we ablate about 13 microns of cornea. And you want to be left conservatively like I am. You want to be left with at least about 300 microns of residual baseline of, of the bed of the cornea. So if you don't have enough to allow for the 100 micron flap, I mean, there's all these calculations we do in our head and on paper, um, then you can consider PRK. There's also patients who are in contact sports who prefer not to have a LASIK flap, so they consider doing PRK. But now with the EVO ICL, which is the implantable contact lens, you know, there's no reason to push the limits of safety. So LASIK is approved um, uh, for correcting myopia upwards of, you know, minus, much higher than minus 10, um, not much higher, I'm sorry. Um, it's approved to for correction of, um, in, based on the laser you use, minus 12, minus 14. But in, in our practice, we actually don't use LASIK to correct any myopia more than minus 8.5 uh, or 8-ish, partly because one is I would like not to ablate a large percentage of the corneal thickness, uh, but even if everything, all the parameters are normal. And the second reason is because the 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 amount of flattening that it would require to correct a myopia of more than minus 8 will impact the contrast of someone's vision. So the quality of vision they would get is not going to be very good. So I, I'm very comfortable moving a patient off the spectrum for, for, from corneal-based procedures to the EVO ICL, which is an implantable contact lens, which is a lens that's implanted behind the pupil, and it can correct a myopia of minus 3 to minus 16 and, or higher if you want to piggyback LASIK with it too. And it's a wonderful option for patients who don't have enough corneal thickness to allow for LASIK or PRK, who have dry eyes, who you worry about you know, LASIK or PRK causing further dry eyes, uh, or have form frust or any concerns, or even keratoconus. Uh, implantable contact lens could be a good option if the patient's keratoconus is on the mild or moderate size side. Okay, and then smile. So smile is uh, a procedure where a small lenticule of tissue is created using a femtosecond laser and the tissue, uh, the lenticule of tissue or the sliver, a tiny sliver of like a contact lens shaped tissue is created using the laser within the, the meat of the cornea. And then that's then removed through an incision that looks like a smile. And that's why it's a great name um, uh, also, but uh, it stands for small uh, lent, oh gosh, small, small intrastromal lenticular extraction. Uh, and so you remove that lenticule and by doing that, you reshape the cornea. And it's the benefits to it uh, as compared to LASIK is one, part of the reason dry eye gets worse with LASIK is because when you create uh, the flap, you're ablating, or I'm sorry, you're cutting corneal nerves uh, uh, for that, uh, to create the flap. And corneal nerves are important in regenerating epithelial cells and, 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 and uh, for the body to respond to dryness of the surface of the cornea. And if you cause loss of sensation, dry eyes can get worse. The smile procedure, <coughs> the smile procedure, you're, you're um, cutting a small bit of these corneal nerves on the surface where the density of the corneal nerves are. And so lower risk of causing dry eyes as a result. There's also the thought of ectasia that there's lower risk. I'm so sorry. There's also um, the issue about the ectasia and um, the fact that the thought being that when you create a LASIK flap, again, again, that LASIK flap removes about 15 to 20% of that tensile strength of the cornea because the flap then doesn't contribute to the tensile strength of the cornea afterwards since it's been cut um, almost 360, it's not fully 360, versus a smile where the surface um, corneal stroma has been left untouched except for that small incision. Um, there's been studies comparing the two, and there's maybe uh, um, some benefits in that regard too. But in, in our practice, we felt like the risk of ectasia is so low if ahead of time, 
you are detecting, you know, with LASIK PRK, the risk of ectasia is quite low in our hands because we are so vigilant about looking for those signs. And we're, we are, again, quite conservative in who we offer LASIK and, and PRK to. And so the benefit of that theoretical benefit or even a slight improvement in the risk of ectasia in our hands, you know, in a practice that uses advanced diagnostics, we feel that it's, it's really irrelevant. Um, but what we have seen in studies that they compared SMILE to LASIK is that the quality of vision in the current form of SMILE is not as good as you see with LASIK, most definitely not short term and even long term in some studies where some patients had LASIK in one eye and SMILE in the other, they uh, generally preferred their LASIK eye over their SMILE. But having said that, there is a new version or new update to the SMILE uh, laser that's coming out that will likely be a significant improvement over the previous generation. And I feel strongly based on the data that I have seen that there may be uh, another story to talk about, maybe come a couple of years from now and I'll be happy to share my experience with you. I do think there's a place for a smile. I don't think any, as, just as I mentioned with ICL, PRK, smile, you know, there's a alphabet, uh, uh, alphabet soup for refractive procedures too. And a refractive surgeon, in order for us to really be a comprehensive refractive surgeon, you got to know how to, uh, how to customize the treatment option to your patients. There is no one size, size fits all. And, um, you know, I think you know, patients can get in trouble if they have, you know, if they think that LASIK is the only way uh, and they pursue only LASIK because LASIK is a wonderful option for the right patients and PRK is a great option for the other types of patients and ICL and there's some overlap definitely, um, but I don't think any procedure is necessarily superior to another. I think for every patient, there's one or two options that are the best out of the bunch of options that are available. With ICL, the implantable lens, is there a risk of cataracts? Yeah, Gloria, I think wanted to make a comment. Gloria, did you wanna say something? I just wanted to interject to give you a moment to breathe <laughs> and to say how much I love Netashami, this woman, because you can tell how passionate about corneal surgery and disease and how much she loves what she's doing by giving her an opportunity to speak about the alphabet soup of cornea transplant. And oh, I, I just had to say that because you, first of all, you need to breathe. <laughs> and you are just amazing, such Thank an you. incredible surgeon. And I would refer any patient to you. Oh, and I just want to say that I definitely, um, you know, all the pearls that you're giving our audience today on corneal transplantation and cornea surgeries is just um, very, very helpful. And all of it, I would agree with. Thank you. Love you. I miss working with you, Gloria. <laughs> So, so did, going back to ICL, the yeah. implantable contact lens is a really incredible refractive tool, refractive option for patients. It is a small, you know, essentially like a contact lens that's implanted behind the pupil, as I mentioned, through a very small incision. And one of the benefits of the implantable contact lens is that there is, besides that two and a half millimeter incision that we create to implant it in the eye, there are no extensive incisions in the cornea. And so the concerns around dry eyes is not there. There's no, you know, you, you're not cutting into corneal nerves. It's also essentially, it's not fully reversible because obviously patient's eye has had surgery, but it's a remo removable device. So if let's say for some reason, the patient doesn't like to have the lens implant, it can be removed with very little risk to the patient's eyes. The question was, does it cause cataracts? The implantable contact lens, the current generation, called the EVO ICL, which has a central port in uh, four central, uh, I'm sorry, five ports within it, but one central one in the, in the optic of the lens to allow for the fluid inside the eye, the nutrient fluid inside the eye to circulate around the lens, has much lower risk of cataract formation in the lifetime of the patient than the previous generation implantable contact lens had. Um, and so, if the surgery is done atraumatically, which you know every surgeon who does the ICL should really do everything they can to implant this lens with the least amount of trauma to the you know to the lens. I mean, I I literally am I hold my breath when I'm inserting it to make sure there's no movement, 
that this lens goes right behind the pupil. It's actually a very pr simple procedure, especially for, for me, I, I do corneal surgeries and such. So I'm very comfortable working in the depth of the eye. And so this lens gently slips into behind the pupil, doesn't touch the lens. Um, cataract does not form unless, unless surgically there's trauma, which again, I rarely ever see if at all. And then there is that risk of cataract if there was not circulation of fluid around the lens. But now with the EVO, there's circulation. And there's a study that looked at 10 year results. And within the 10 years, the rates of cataract formation were essentially equivalent to, the, to an eye that has never had the ICL. So it's physiological they, they, rates they of cataract. Like, they put fenestrations in it, little holes in the lens. Yeah, so little ports, ports or fenestration, yeah. And is it's there, really, I mean, my happiest patients are my ICL. Some of my happiest patients are my ICL patients. It's life-changing, partly because most, my, most of my ICL patients are patients who had such high amount of nearsightedness that uh, it, it is truly life-changing for these patients. And how about any risk of glaucoma? Yeah, so the risk of glaucoma, again, is uh, there's two... Um, types of risks of glaucoma. One is that immediate, right after the surgery, um, if the pressure goes up because of two reasons. One, if there's, um, the, we use what's called viscoelastic, which is a, a material we use to cushion the structures of the eye, including the lens of the, uh, including, including the natural lens of the eye, so that when you implant the ICL, it doesn't touch the lens to cause cataract. Sometimes though, that goopy stuff that we use to protect everything cushion can stay in the eye and can, can, can kind of clog up the filtration of the inside of the eye and cause pressure spikes immediately after surgery. Um, so that's one kind of acute cause for glaucoma. Again, as a surgeon, we spend a lot of time clearing out that, that goopy stuff and that I've never seen in our practice. Another reason is if the lens is too big for the eye. If the lens, because we have to size this eye, the, the lens implant, the ICL, for the eye, sometimes the sizing may not be perfect. And if the lens is too big for the eye, then the circulation of the fluid inside the eye can get blocked by that lens and can cause the pressure to go up. That requires, again, preventative measures where we, as a, as a surgeon, uh, we really spend a lot of time doing all the right measurements and the chan and then mo close monitoring. So I see our patients the same day after surgery. They go into our office. They're seen the same day. I give them the right medicine to lower the pressure, all preventative measures, and we see them again the next day. And if the lens looks at all slightly oversized, I don't hesitate to change that lens. So I'm like, you know, going right back in. So if you get the patient past that first two days or three days with sizing and the goopiness being removed. The risk of glaucoma, again, with the right size lens in an eye over the lifetime of the patient is likely and, and has been shown to be essentially equivalent to an eye that doesn't have the ICL. Now, keep in mind, patients with ICLs do have higher rates of glaucoma, but not because of the ICL, but because they're usually highly myopic. So high myopes or someone who's extreme nearsighted, who is a patient who needs an ICL, tends to have higher risk of glaucoma formation. So it's a selection bias, essentially, because these are, pa these are patients who would have had a higher risk of glaucoma regardless. So my message to my patients always is that just because you got the ICL and now you see 2020 or better, doesn't mean you shouldn't continue seeing your eye doctor uh, on an annual basis, doesn't mean you should like forget about seeing an eye doctor until you develop cataract in your 60s. You need to go annually because you're still a high myope, you still are at risk of retinal tears, retinal detachment, and you still have a higher risk of glaucoma, not because of the ICL, but because you, uh, the anatomy of your eye is a myopic eye. Is it going to be harder for us to examine the retina? Not at all. No, not at all. This uh, ICL is perfectly pristine, cle uh, clear, and the pupil dilates beyond it. Not at all. And so for the patients that are watching out there, what is the prescriptions that you recommend the ICL for? Well, again, in my practice, more than minus eight and a half, we, you know, without even looking, even if they had enough corneal tissue to justify LASIK, I feel strongly that ICL is a safer procedure. Safer and better because the quality of vision with LASIK or PRK will not be as good beyond about a minus eight and a half, at least in my hands. 
and then also safer because you're not ablating too much tissue, too much corneal tissue, dry eyes is less and all of that. So minus eight and a half, hands down. We, we've taught our technicians, they know that if a patient calls in and they have more than mine, that they should already know about ICL. If it's less than minus eight and a half, then it comes down to, is there enough corneal tissue to justify LASIK or to allow for LASIK or PRK? Um, and if there is enough corneal tissue, then LASIK and PRK are you know, more straightforward. There's faster recovery. It's not an intraocular surgery. So, um, so theoretically less invasive. Now that the caveat being, if there is a patient who has significant dry eyes, and a patient whose dry eyes is not responsive to conservative, just kind of conservative measures, I tend to lean towards ICL even as low. I mean, I've put an ICL as low as minus three, which is the lowest power it goes in a patient who had severe dry eyes, Sjogren's disease, someone I don't want to do corneal procedure on, and they're intolerant of contact lenses. And, and so they're really, um, uh, you know, really are motivated to have freedom from glasses and contacts, then absolutely ICL uh, is a fantastic option for those patients. And then one last one, patient with form fruits or keratoconus, family history of keratoconus, any concerns around ectasia, then, you know, minus three and above should be ICL. If you had somebody who was minus 15 in both eyes, would you consider doing it both eyes on the same day? Yeah, I do do them actually both eyes on the same day. And I think it's a great way to go. Um, I used to not, I used to be but, you know, worried about what if this, the only reason not to, not the only, one of the reasons not to is if you're concerned about sizing and if you have to exchange uh, the lens for a different size, you now are kind of, chances are you'll have to exchange both lenses if you've implanted, but, but we've gotten so good. Our technicians uh, have gotten so good at sizing these lenses that I, I saw, I looked at my, my, my numbers and I saw how rarely I have to change the size. The other concern is if you get the spike in pressure immediately, and is there a danger to the patient if both eyes have high pressures? Again, I'm pretty um, uh, vigilant about making sure that the gelatinous, you know, the viscoelastic is removed from the eye. We put patients on diamox, we do the right sizing, we keep the pupils dilated, we do everything. And I have, knock on wood, I have not had a single case of high pressures immediately after surgery. So I saw all these reasons uh, that were holding me back. And because of uh, very, very extreme low rates of it in my hands, I felt that it was the convenience for the patients and the ability to have great vision from both eyes, because it was very difficult for them to have one eye corrected to 2020 and the other eye still minus 16. And so, um, yeah, I do bilateral unless there is a reason not to. I have one more question for you before I turn it over to Dr. Chu. Uh, I don't want her to feel left out here, but I do want to ask you about guided topography, guided uh, 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 refractive surgery. Yeah, so there's different approaches to refractive surgery to address those um, higher order aberrations that Dr. Chu mentioned. There's, you know, wavefront uh, optimized, wavefront guided. There's topographic guided. Topographic guided is looking at uh, the, the surface topography, like was mentioned by Dr. Chu, and address and treating selectively those areas of steepening to try to create a more normal contour. I don't do topo guided. I, I, I really am looking to add that to my practice. I think it's a great tool. I don't think it's necessarily, again, one size fits all. I think it's one of those tools that will be is useful for specific types of patients and not all. Well, I want to thank you for that. that. That was tremendous information. Dr. Chu, I want to end with you on contact lenses, scleral contacts, soft contact lenses, specialty contact lenses for keratoconus when we have to go that, that route. Are there soft contacts like a Novacone that works well, or would you just right, go right to the scleral lens? And when would you use a soft contact lens like a Novacone as opposed to going right to scleral lenses or even regular gas permeable contact lens that sits on the cornea? So as with corneal surgeries and procedures, <laughs> there's not one contact lens that works for everyone. So you really have to understand the patient's profession, what they do and what their goal is in terms of vision. So as you mentioned, there's a whole range of contact lenses ranging from soft toric lenses to specialty soft lenses that tend to be thicker. And due to the thickness and 
um, greater rigidity, it helps to neutralize some of the um, higher order aberrations on the irregular cornea. Then you have RGPs that are on the cornea and they sit right on the cornea and there's a tear lens beneath that helps to essentially neutralize the irregular cornea, hybrids and sclerals. So they're all very different. And I think contact lens selection depends on the presentation of the cornea as well as their refraction. And if you're able to refract well with and you're getting good vision in glasses, you should stick with glasses or soft toric contacts. If the vision is not satisfactory in glasses or a soft contact, that's when you look at some of the specialty lens options. The first being a soft lens that they're thicker, you know, they're not as easy to handle as soft toric and conventional lenses. So the uh, Nova Cone and some of the specialty soft lenses, in a sense, sometimes they're like a mini scleral because they're so thick and you have to balance it on your finger. And sometimes they kind of roll right off and they're harder to apply onto the cornea surface. So there's still a learning curve in using specialty soft lenses, but they tend to be more comfortable than the rigid gas permeable lenses that sit directly on the cornea. As we know, the cornea is one of the most highly innervated tissues on the body and very sensitive to dust, dirt, and a hard piece of plastic. So there's definitely awareness in the beginning, but if the patient can tolerate it, the rigid gas permeable lenses are easier to fit, they're more cost efficient, and they require less maintenance. So you can clean them, put them on, take them off easier than the modalities of the hybrid and scleral lens. So if your patient can tolerate an RGP, fantastic. The biggest complication with the smaller GPs are that they decenter and they may pop out of the eye easier, especially in the more irregular shaped corneas when the patient's looking to the side quickly or something flies at them, they can dislodge easier than the hybrid and scleral lenses. So hybrid lenses are interesting. They give you better optics with the rigid center and they're bonded to a soft skirt that aligns you know, around the cornea. So they tend to be more comfortable than RGPs alone, but they're much thicker and different from soft lenses. So I wouldn't expect patients to feel as comfortable in a hybrid lens as they would a traditional soft lens. Generally, scleral lenses are reserved for more complex cases where patients have failed RGPs, soft lenses, glasses. And, you know, Dr. Shami alluded to this earlier, but scleral lenses, because of the fluid chamber within the lens, works miraculously for patients with ocular surface disease. So in addition to irregular corneas, Scleral lenses are very helpful in patients with chronic dry eye from Stevens-Johnson, graft-versus-host disease, Sjogren's syndrome, um, not only irregular corneas like post-transplant eyes or keratoconus, but can greatly help to improve dry eye symptoms. The lens acts like a barrier to protect the cornea. The fluid prevent, uh, provides constant lubrication, and you can get really crisp optics with larger optic zones, more stability because it doesn't move like the smaller RGP contacts. So we're really lucky today to have such a great selection and variety of different types of contacts that need to be customized for the patient. Are they an athlete? Are they a college student? Do they have an active lifestyle? Are they retired? Do they, do they you know, there's a lot of um, uh, factors that go into deciding the best contact lens modality for a patient, as well as kind of ease of application and removal. Scleral lenses require all kinds of tools. I happen to have some sitting on my desk here. You got to have plungers, you have to have insertion plungers, removal plungers, different fluids to fill the lens and clean the lens. So with every modality, there's different pros and cons, but I'm very fortunate to have access to scleral lenses that work in the most 
complex corneas that couldn't tolerate soft or RGP lenses. So um, that's, that's contact lenses in a nutshell. Do you have a favorite brand of scleral lenses? I work with multiple brands. I can't say that I have one favorite. Um, different brands tend to specialize in maybe they have a particular size, they have particular um, options where you can create micro vaults, you could do cutouts, you could do uh, channels. There's even impression molding technology that you can fit very aligned over glaucoma tubes and um, shunts even. So I think different brands have different um, uh, benefits. So I will use a particular brand or size for a particular patient that I uh, see fit. And how well have you done with uh, the soft lenses? For keratoconus patients? Yes. So in the mild forms, fantastic. Uh, you know, if they see well with glasses, they can also see well with soft contact lenses. The challenge comes when there's more ectasia and distortion on the shape of the eye that soft contacts are unable to correct what we call irregular astigmatism. And that is contrasted with regular astigmatism, which is in the majority of our, our um, the people that can be corrected with glasses and contacts. So as the disease becomes more advanced, soft lenses don't work as well, unless you're talking about the custom soft lenses that are thicker, and tend to mask higher order aberrations and irregularities better. So the custom soft lenses are a good option for I would say the, the mild to moderate keratoconus patients. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Chu and Dr. Shami. It was such a wonderful, you've been so wonderful with your time. Dr. Chu, if people wanna find out more about you, how could they do that? Well, I currently practice at the USC Rossi Eye Institute in Los Angeles. Um, I have an Instagram, gosh, what is my, my name? Um, I, gosh, I can't even believe I forgot my name. It's just, um, that's what a two hour interview will be. <laughs> Chu O D. So it's G L O R I A C H I U O D. So you can find me on social media. I literally joined LinkedIn two weeks ago. So I'm trying to understand and learn how to use the LinkedIn platform. But I think social media has been such an amazing way to connect. And even for me to stay engaged with Nana Shami, she's, you know, she was at USC. She now has her own practice at the Maloney Shami Vision Institute. And I'm so proud of you. I've learned so much from you. You've been an incredible mentor for my entire career. And it's just been such a dream to be here with you. And of course, Dr. Carrie Gelb, who is moderating everything. So yeah, you can find me, um, Gloria Chu OD. And I would most <laughs> definitely try to find Gloria Chu because I she I send her all my patients who are keratoconics and, and otherwise she is incredible, passionate as can be, as she, as you can tell. And uh, we grew, we grew up together, although I was already grown before <laughs> I met you. I'm I've grown that. old with you and you've grown up. You know, I remember a particular conversation where you said you had to color your hair because of white hairs. And I said, I don't have any white hairs. And you gave me this look. Don't worry. I have plenty of white hairs now that have come with time. And so with I time. feel your pain. It comes with wisdom. <laughs> at, least, at least you both have hair. <laughs> um, so Dr. Shami, how could people find out more about you? Well, you're um, like Gloria was saying. You are. You can find me on um, on on our website, MaloneyShamiVision.com. Uh, um, you can also find me on Instagram, Netta Shami MD. Um, I'm not. I am on LinkedIn, although I don't know. I, I think I maybe signed in ten years ago. It's been a long time, so I don't even know if I'm there. But um, you can most definitely reach out to me. And, and my email is um, ns at maloneyshami.com. If you have questions, I'll do my best to answer. But it's such a pleasure to be here with you, Carrie. And thank you again for the treat to have me here with Gloria. 
Um, Gloria, you and I need to go out for dinner. Do. Let's do that. Lunch and meet up. For and sure. Maybe we'll invite you the second time we get together. We need to catch up. Yeah. <laughs> what part of California are both of you in? You uh, just... Los Angeles. Los yeah, Angeles. West Los Angeles. Well, I want to thank both of them for sharing their knowledge. They've been very generous with their time. This is Dr. Kerry Gell for Open Your Eyes. Thank you for joining me today. Until next thank time. You. Thank, thank you. So thank you. Bye, everyone. Rub your eyes often? Blurry or double vision driving at night? Red light, stop. You may have keratoconus, a progressive eye disease which can cause vision loss. Visit couldidbkc.com to take the quiz. If you rub your eyes and are experiencing changes to your vision, this may be a symptom of keratoconus, a progressive eye disease that may lead to significant vision loss. Early diagnosis is important, so don't ignore the simple act of rubbing your eyes. Please visit livingwithkc.com. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicel technology. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.